Right, okay, so without much ado, I think I'll start now. So thank you very much for coming to uh, my 10th and possibly final talk in this series. Uh, which, and this talk would be called, uh, How Can We Improve Our Memory? Insights from a Cognitive Neuropsychologist. Here's an outline of the talk. I'll briefly go into what is memory, but very briefly. Then I'll talk a tiny bit about sensory experiences and our individual differences, because ultimately the big question is always, I want to get better at memory, or why is so-and-so's memory better? And this comes down to two different things, our sensory abilities and the fact that we are born different and we experience different things and some of us get better practice at things. So those two things actually are the bedrock of the reasons that some people are exceptional at memory and other people are not exceptional. Then I'm going to go into the cognitive side of my talk, which is basically to explain why memory is complex, but also where you can improve it. So there are three stages of memory that I'll go through, which are encoding, storage and retrieval. And then at the end, I'll briefly uh, touch on external factors that are involved in memory, um, but that will be a real flyby. I want to start with this metaphor, which is fading footprints. Uh, some of you may or may not know this, but this, is, this footprint is known as the footprint of Eve. And it was found in uh, the country of my birth, Kenya, in East Africa. And it's of um, a female that uh, lived 1.5 million years ago. And it's uh, known as the oldest footprint. And it's, she was called Eve because uh, there's this idea that this is where we took our first footsteps in, um, in our evolution. And then eventually from uh, East Africa, we moved to the other continents. So this is the footprint of Eve uh, 1.5 million years ago. Whereas these are fading footprints in sand um, where the instant you put your foot onto the sand, if it's um, slightly wet, you'll get a nice indentation. But slowly that footprint will um, start fading. And effectively it takes time for that footprint to fade. And that's a useful metaphor for memory because memory effectively works like that. And this is a graph that I've shown before of how um, memory starts off um, very strong. So I could tell you what I've just said a minute ago very easily. Whereas what I said at the beginning of the talk, uh, it has, has already started fading. And as time goes on, so on the horizontal x-axis, you've got the number of hours since learning something. So one hour, eight hours, 24 hours later, etc. What you're seeing is those fading footprints of the memory in my head. And the thing that cognitive psychologists have been trying to understand is why it fades like this and what are the processes involved and I imagine some of you would like to know how to make that curve not go right to the bottom and effectively forget things. So important in all of this is the fact that memory is a staged process and there are three different aspects to uh, memory. The first is known as encoding and that's basically literally taking the information in. And there are a number of different things that go on when we take information in, which will be important for helping us understand how we can improve memory. The next is storage. So you can take something in, but you need to put it somewhere. So how do you lay it down? And what are the things that you can do to improve storing your information? And then the final one is retrieval. You could have laid something down well, but if you can't find it, then it's not going to be much use to you. So being able to find it is important. So the majority of the talk is going to be going through different things that we know from 30, 40, 50 years of research to understand the processes involved at each of these different stages and how we know that some things make that worse, some things make it better. Uh, 
Many of you will already know what I call my memory tree, but I know that there are at least some people, such as Dylan, my new neighbor upstairs, uh, who are watching this for the first time. So for the benefit of those first timers, uh, here is my memory tree. So in the previous talk, I showed that by studying people with memory problems, we can understand that memory is a very complex, multifaceted skill. So the most basic uh, differentiation is between short-term memory, which is for the last minute, not the last few weeks, the last minute or so. So if I gave you my office for former office phone number, you would hold it in your short-term memory to try to remember what it is that I'm saying. Anything beyond that. So even the last slide that I showed you is, has already been pushed out of short-term memory. And if it's lucky enough, it'll move into long-term memory. The long-term memory itself breaks up into two different parts known as procedural memory, which is memory for skills such as playing a guitar or being able to touch type or driving a car, etc., and declarative memory, which is memory for information, the, uh, actual uh, memory for facts. And that itself breaks down into two different things, which is memory for events known as episodic memory. So remembering my 50th birthday party or memory for pure facts that aren't anything to do with me, such as Einstein's famous equation of memory. So what we see here is that memory is this multifaceted uh, and multi-component system. And so having a better memory is already a complex issue because it's a better memory for what? Um, an amazing guitarist has a better procedural memory than I ever will. But maybe my semantic memory for capitals of the world is much better than his or hers. So already good memory, better memory, etc., has been complicated by the fact that we need to define what we mean by better memory. So with that in the background, what I want to talk about is the very first stage of uh, memory or experiences, which is bringing information in. So this uh, is a type of graph or a diagram that many of you will now be familiar with from my talks. So it's a, an idealized diagram of the human brain with the front of the brain on the right hand, sorry, left hand side, where it says um, frontal lobe and the back of the brain is the green bit on the right hand side known as the occipital lobes. The reason I've used this is because um, of the, what are known as the sensory cortices and the sensory cortices are where we bring information in uh, when we first experience anything. So right now I'm seeing things and the seeing part of our experiences starts off at the back of the brain, back here in that green area known as the occipital lobes. And just a bit further um, up, you've got the sensory cortex, which brings together um, uh, information from your hands, from your feeling receptors, etc. Down at the bottom, on the bottom left, you've got the um, label for the auditory cortex, which is actually the, um, the yellow bit. And that's a bit inside the brain, which is why those metal prongs look like they're pulling the brain apart just to show you the inside. So that's where we hear things. So it's somewhere in here, but not on the surface. Then moving clockwise, we see a label for the olfactory cortex, which is our sense of smell. So that's that kind of I don't know, pinkish color. And so that's deeper inside the brain. And then finally, we've got the gustatory cortex, which is for our taste, which is the purple bit. And again, that's uh, further inside the brain. So what we've got there are, are the five areas where our five senses bring information in. So what I'm seeing right now, what I'm hearing right now, what I'm feeling uh, physically in terms of the, the, my uh, um, touch receptors that show me that I'm sitting down, etc. cetera, um, any taste or smell that I have. So that's how our experience of the, the present moment is happening. And if any of you have ever done uh, mindfulness meditation, you'll know that what you start off with in mindfulness meditation is trying to get back to those senses so that you're experiencing this moment rather than the thoughts that come in or are created from those experiences. But for what we're doing, 
the thing is that that information is how things come in and then it moves forward after that. Now, an important point here in terms of memory is that we've got these five senses and we all differ hugely in those. So, for example, I'm as blind as a bat. Uh, I've got extremely strong contact lenses on and I wouldn't be able to read a thing on the screen right now without my contact lenses. So I've got rubbish eyes. Uh, and so my retina, which is the piece of my eye that takes information in, might be a bit rubbish. Um, my sense of smell is quite okay. My sense of hearing is quite good, etc. So within myself, some of my senses are stronger than others. Now take another person, they'll have a different uh, pattern of what they're good at, etc. Now, one of the big things that we study in psychology and human behavior is known as individual differences because we're not all clones of one another. And most of you now know that I've, I'm an identical twin. So there's someone who looks exactly the same as me, born 20 minutes before me. And even though we're identical twins genetically, there are already some different, there were differences between us. So if he and I are different to one another, then me and another person of our own age are going to be hugely different. So just to demonstrate this, this is, um, this is a, an idealized graph, a, a diagram of the um, taste part of our tongue. And um, the graph is for, uh, sorry, diagram on the left-hand side is for um, those little um, dots that, that you have on your tongue. And those are the receptors that take in information about the tastes that are in the food that you put in your, into your mouth. And those little, um, little dots are known as papillae. What you see on the left-hand side is that this uh, the, 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 there's only five of those in that uh, little area, which might be this, uh, um, about half a centimeter wide. But you go to the right-hand side and you see a super taster's tongue. And you see there are far more of these papillae within the same area for that person. And there are people who are known as super tasters. I was watching a documentary the other day about a, a, a crisp factory where they make wonderful potato crisps and they employ people who are super tasters that go through rigorous testing who are known to be able to tell the differences between different tastes, too much salt, too little salt, etc., etc., much better than the average person. So that's a, that's a difference that we already have there. I'm sure you know people who've got really acute hearing compared to other people who can't tell the difference between two sounds. So we've got those differences already happening at that sensory level. So if we if we took the amount of information from those two, these two tongues on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, we've already got different amounts of information that's going to be taken into the brain from those sensory receptors to further up in the brain where it's going to be processed for understanding information. So whatever happens next, the person on the right hand side has got more information to play with. So if we think about that, the fact that this exists for taste, it also exists for sound, it exists for vision, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, then you can see already that we've got this spectrum which is our normal, uh, which is usually has this normal distribution, that bell-shaped curve, where most of us are in the middle, and some people are exceptionally good, like these super tasters, and some people who are, who are very poor at it. So already right from the start, we've got our five senses, and we know that for each of these senses, we've got a spectrum. Now, given the fact that this current moment for me right now involves hearing things, seeing things, possibly if, if we were having dinner on a beach somewhere, I would be hearing things, tasting things, etc. All of that is coming in as sensory information. So the amount that is taken in to begin with will have an impact on how much I can recall later on. Okay, so the next aspect once we know that um, there's sensory processing going on is what what we do with it to 
take it in. Now with the taste and smell, we can't really do much, but with visual information, especially information that's written down, and most people, when they ask me about uh, how to improve their memory. They don't, they're not meaning how can I improve my memory for different tastes of apples. They mean remembering words or people's names or capitals of countries or something like that. So it tends to be verbal information that they want to remember. And an extremely important piece of research that was done uh, 50 odd years ago is known as the levels of processing theory. And it was done by this gentleman, not me, not, not the one on the right, the one on the left. And that man's name is Fergus Craig. And Fergus Craig was doing his PhD, I think, in his uh, Scott. He was doing his PhD in uh, Toronto um, at basically the mothership of memory research. And he was doing it with Endel Tulving um, and Lockhart. And uh, Tulving specific, especially was one of the major, major, major people in memory research. And they came up with this concept, which, is no, which has become known as levels of processing. And this is a reaction against the fact that before them, People didn't actually refer to the types of information, types of processing you did to information. They just talked about whether it was for five minutes or five hours and whether it was for skills or for facts. But they said, actually, it's what you do with the information that's important. So they did a study in which um, they, they gave a class of students some words. And one of the groups, let's say, uh, 10 of the people, they were asked to just um, tick whether there are any capitals in the word that they were given. So simply, if there's a capital letter anywhere in the word, then tick it. The next group were given um, the task that tick the word if it rhymes with the word wait. So eight, yes, book, no, etc. So they just had to do a rhyming judgment. The third group had to write down whether it fitted into this sentence, I met a something on the street. So um, book, no, dog, yes. So the idea was that the first group only had to say whether there was a capital letter or not. The second letter group had to um, say whether the word rhymed with something. And the third one had to say whether it could plausibly fit into an English sentence. So they did this, and then half an hour later, um, without warning, um, I mean, not as a surprise, uh, but uh, they hadn't warned them that they were going to do this test. They gave everyone a piece of paper and asked them to just write down any words that they remembered from half an hour before. And this is what they got. So on the y-axis, it's the number of words that they recognized. I think actually this is a recognition task, but it doesn't matter. So they had to just tick, did you see this word before or not? And along the x-axis horizontally, we've got the type of encoding. So the structural encoding is the same as the shallow, so whether there was a, a capital letter or not. The phonemic was the sound, and the semantic was whether it fitted into the sentence or not. And what we see is that the people who only had to look at a word and say whether there was a capital letter T in it or a capital letter in it got less than 20% recognition. The people who had to say whether it, it um, rhymed with the word got about 50%, and the people who had to say whether it fitted into a sentence got about 80%. And that became known as the levels of processing um, idea. Because what they were showing here is that it's not just taking information in, it's what you do with it, which is going to impact how well you remember it later on. So what this shows is that informa when information is coming in, you can have those great eyes or the great taste or uh, taste buds, etc. but you need to do something with it. So that's about the level of processing that you take it to. Now, the, uh, the, what this showed us is that memory is not a passive store. It's not something that you just put information into and then take it out. It's what you do with it that's important. And this research study, I think it was done in India, um, looked at this. And I think this was done because the 
Indian education system uh, came out of a very Victorian model and uh, unfortunately India, part of the Indian um, education system is still stuck in the Victorian era because kids there are taught to learn by rote. So they're taught to just see the information, copy it down, remember it and then regurgitate it. So uh, this researcher, and I'm not going to embarrass myself or them by trying to say his name or her name, they conducted a survey on learning strategies. So they looked at how students try to remember things. Then the uh, students took an assessment of reading, maths and their science skills. And what they found is that the students who had said in the first stage during the survey that they used pure memorization to learn performed much worse than students who used other learning strategies such as elaboration where they thought about the information they wrote something about the information they drew uh, their, uh, their own uh, uh, diagrams of it etc etc so what this showed is that this pure memorization which is just literally seeing the information and copying it down is effectively a shallow form of processing because these, those students who've just memorized without actually letting the information touch the sides, as it were, they weren't doing enough with the information to make it last and to remember well. So what we have here is that the way you take the information in, in that early stages, is going to make a huge impact on whether you retain it later on or not. And this reminds me of um, giving a lecture at um, a former university uh, about face recognition disorders or amnesia or something. And a student came up to me afterwards and said, God, that lecture was amazing. And I thought, thank you very much. Then she said, but I'm not going to be able to remember all of that. And straight away, I already knew that she, won't, she wouldn't do well in the exam because she, to she told me without saying so that she thought that studying was about taking the information in and then remembering it and that's it whereas by the time you're at university you should be taking information in doing something with it so taking it to a deeper level and then being able to use that information appropriately later on when you need it such as in an exam and i've seen this time and again with university students that I can predict what mark they're going to get after I've read the first paragraph. I know that's shocking, um, but the, I've got a really high degree of accuracy that after the first paragraph, I know. Because the way someone writes that first paragraph tells me whether they, they're just going to regurgitate everything I said. And I've seen essays where I think I know what he or she's going to say next, because it was the next slide in my talk in my lecture two months before and then the next slide and then he said this and then he said that whereas the good ones they've taken the information in done stuff with it and then given me their version of it and that's shown me that they've taken it to a deeper level so um for anyone who's thinking about trying to learn things don't do it in terms of a shallow form of processing and just regurgitating it you need to do much more than that with it Another thing which will be important for the younger students, but even for anyone else who's trying to learn things, is known as the unattended speech effect. Excuse me. And the unattended speech effect was an, a wonderful, interesting finding for, um, that was done here in Brighton, in fact, by one of the gods of memory research in the UK, Alan Badley, who created uh, what's known as the working memory model that all A-level teachers, I'm sure, um, will be teaching their students. And what they found in the, the study that they were looking at, that they were doing, was that they, even if you try to block out certain sounds, they will still come in and they affect your encoding. Uh, the details of this graph aren't very important, but in this particular task, what they were doing was to get people to try to remember sequences of words um, that were either um, a, five, a list of five words, six words, seven words, or eight words. And along the y-axis, you've got the number of errors that people made. Now, what they did is that they had, uh, they 
um, had the people trying to remember the information um, after, uh, sorry, they taught people the information either under quiet conditions, so those are the, the, the solid lines, or while they were hearing speech in uh, headphones. So we've got two different conditions in the study. One, you try to learn your list of five words in complete silence, or the other, you try to listen to those five words while there's yakking going on in your ears through um, headphones. And the, um, the difference between um, the left and the right hand side of each graph doesn't matter. Simply the difference between the dashed line, which is where people were hearing speech, and in quiet conditions. And what you find is that there's always going to be more errors when um, speech is happening than when it's quiet. Now, this is really important, and it became known as the unattended speech effect because it means that even if you're trying to block out speech that's happening around you, it's going to get in, and then it's going to interfere with the, the information that you're trying to learn at the moment. And this is particularly difficult, or particularly the uh, case, when the information that you're trying to learn is complex because of things that I can't speak about right now because it's far too complex, but we know that the types of processing that are required when you're trying to understand complicated information is really quite uh, uh, specific and it requires a certain amount of concentration. And those words that you're hearing that you're trying to ignore, they still get in. So one of the big things that comes out of this research is that when you're trying to learn something that's possibly difficult or important, to not do it whilst listening to music, especially with lyrics. If you're listening to work, uh, music with lyrics in it, then that those words will get in as the unattended speech effect has shown. So those people who study whilst listening to heavy music in headphones, they're already reducing the amount of information that they're taking into their brains. The next aspect of memory is the context that you're learning in. And this is a remarkable finding, again, by that great god, Endel Tolving. And what he said was that in the way we learn is important but also the context that we're in when we try to remember something is really important. So he developed what's known as the encoding specificity principle, which is that the probability of recall depends on how closely the context at the time of testing matches the context that was present during encoding. So effectively what he was saying is that Learn it in a particular condition, and if you're in the same condition later on, you're more likely to remember things. And if it's different, then you might forget things. Which led to a rather interesting study done by the British god, Alan Badley, where they had scuba divers learn information, so lists of words, and they taught people, either these scuba divers, they taught the information either in a dry learning environment, so outside a swimming pool, or in a wet learning environment in the deep end of a swimming pool. And then they tested them either dry or wet. And so what we get is that if we have our people who learned under dry conditions and they're tested recall under dry conditions, they did really well. But those people who learned something outside the swimming pool, if they were then tested in the deep end of the pool underwater, they did poorly. If people were taught inside the, the deep end of the pool, so underwater, and tested underwater, they did really well. But if they were tested outside the swimming pool, they did poorly. So that beautiful uh, this study really beautifully demonstrates how important the context of your environment is for learning. And I won't go into this uh, too much, but suffice to say that right now, I might be trying to learn this information in front of me, 
but my brain is also taking all of this information in. And if it's taking that information in, if I'm in a similar state when I try to recall it later on, then there are more um, cues, as we call them, so ways to remember available. Now, um, this has uh, implications, um, and there is work that's been done, for example, in mood states. So work has been done with people uh, where, where they've um, induced a happy mood or a sad mood in people and taught them information. And then they've tested them either happy or sad. And what they found is that if you, if you teach um, people something while they're happy and you test them again later on while they're happy, they do well. But if you test them while they're sad, they'll do badly. If you test, if you teach people sad information, um, sorry, if you have get people into a sad state and teach them happy things, they will find it difficult. So what this, this study has shown is one of the things that clinical psychologists find that um, people who are um, de uh, feeling depression, they find it very easy to remember the things that they learned when they were sad before. They find it very difficult to recall the happier things. And so part of the therapy is to try to break that link there. And it's because of the encoding specificity principle and this fact that the state that someone is in when they're learning something and the state that they're in when they're trying to recall it, it, it they should match and it has an impact. And I'm happy to answer questions about this later. Now, just to show that things can get really weird, um, comes in marijuana. So before, before uh, research <laughs> needed to get ethics, in the States, uh, someone did a study where uh, students were taught information um, after taking uh, maybe a cigarette, I think, that was, had nothing in it, apart from the cigarette stuff, known as a placebo, or it had marijuana in it, so basically a joint. So students were taught under, either stoned, or not stoned, but they'd, they'd had a puff, let's say, or with a cigarette which didn't have any, any uh, drugs in it. Now what they found is that those people who um, who'd, were in place, who'd had placebo, they tested, they were fine, sorry, if you tested them, uh, recalled them during placebo without, uh, uh, without anything in the cigarette, they did fine. But if you try to, if you got them to test or recall things um, while they were having a joint later on, that problem. So basically, what this difference here shows is that the people who learned under placebo, they found it more difficult to recall things when they'd had the marijuana. And what you get is that the people who have marijuana. If you try to test them under placebo, they don't do as well. They actually do better under marijuana. So this odd study, just like the divers study, shows us that the physical state that we're in has an impact on how we remember things later on. And this is to do with all of the cues that we take in when we're, when we're learning information, whilst we might be thinking that we're only learning that information that's in front of us in the book, the computer, etc., there's other information that is being taken in as well, such as emotional state, etc., etc. The emotional state, for example, being driven by your mood state because of feeling sad, or in this case, because you're a bit high. And trying to work with that is an important thing. Of course, we can't work with that in terms of, of um, research now with marijuana, but it just demonstrates this point quite well. So we've got that taking in of information. The next thing is storing it. Now, excuse me, I've just dropped my phone and the phone is important for me to know whether there's a problem. Okay. Uh... No, no problems yet. 
Okay, so the next stage is laying down that information. So actually, you've taken the information in, you've encoded it deeply, uh, and uh, you've uh, taken care of the environment, etc. How are you going to put it down? So this is a cupboard under the sink, which uh, looks a bit like my cupboard. And this is how it could look if I could be bothered to sort it out. So it's a, a badly stored piece of information would be hard to find. So I'm usually rummaging around under my sink trying to find something which I know is there, but I can't find the damn thing. If I organized it, like the diagram, uh, the photograph below, then maybe I'd have a greater chance of finding it. And so a lot of the things that happen with memory in terms of trying to improve it is actually to do with how you've sorted that information when you put it in. So we've taken the information in by encoding it deeply, but if we can organize it, then we're going to be able to remember it better. So organizing is really important because it's going to improve the chance of finding it later on. And there are a number of ways to improve this organization, but most of them involve what are known as mnemonics. And mnemonics are memory tricks that connect the information that you're trying to learn with known aspects of memory strengths that we know about, such as its capacity, um, linking it to information that we already have in our brains, or our mental imagery. And I'm going to try to go through each of these. So the first of these is known as chunking. Now a central concept, um, which is quite fundamental within especially short-term memory, uh, that presumably A-level teachers teach students, um, but certainly our um, university students learn, is this tenant, which is the magical number seven, plus or minus two. And this is work done by Miller, who, who showed that um, the amount that we can remember tends to be about seven bits of information, give or take two. You rarely get people, if you give them a, a bunch of digits to remember, who can remember 15. You, you can get them, but most of us, our average number that we can remember of unrelated numbers is about seven. And some people are a bit worse, some people are a bit better, but we're, we're all hovering around the seven mark. So one of the things to do with this is to try to capitalize on this. And this uses um, what's known as chunking. And this is a method to maximize the amount of information that you can cram into these seven slots that you've got. Now, um, Miller's number wasn't for seven numbers, it was seven boxes. So it depends on how you use those boxes. So what's been developed are ways to use those seven slots very well. So for example, if I gave you this number to remember, 0, 1, 2, 7, 3, 2, 0, 4, 0, 6, 0, um, it's 10 digits long. But the, if, I, if you knew that 01273 is the Brighton phone code and then thought 204060, then you find it, you'll make it, it'll be much easier to remember one of the taxi company's numbers in Brighton. So this is why you've got, for most companies, they have these memorable numbers because you can break them up and chunk them. So what's happening here is we're chunking. We've got the 01273, which is anyone around the Brighton area knows it's the Brighton uh, telephone code. And then after that, you break the other ones into memorable bits. 204060 is more difficult to remember than 204060. Similarly, with credit card numbers, they're written on your credit card in, um, it's a 16 digit number, but it's written in groups of four because it's easier for you to, to say 4539, 7878, et cetera. I wasn't gonna give you my credit card number. So chunking is a way of accepting that there's a limit to how much information you can take in in one go, but grouping it so you can use your seven slots in a more efficient manner. Another way is the is using acronyms. And this is, of course, important in verbal information. So all sorts of abbreviations like IBM, uh, NS, uh, NASA, uh, UNICEF, uh, 
GOAT, uh, greatest of all time, um, NATO, etc. Those are using acronyms to try to remember inf important uh, things. Radar is uh, an acronym. I can't remember what it is, I'm afraid. And scuba is uh, something breathing apparatus. Um, but those are acronyms for phrases, but it's much easier to remember as these shortened things so that you're using up your seven slots much more efficiently. Another one is known as pegword mnemonics. And pegword mnemonics use uh, things that we already know or are really easy to learn. So a nursery rhyme, uh, I don't know because I uh, was born in Kenya and we didn't learn this in Kenya, but I think kids in the UK might learn it, which is, uh, uh, one is a bun, two is a shoe, three is a tree, four is a door, five is a hive, etc. And so what's being done here is to associate a number with a word which, is, which um, kind of rhymes with the word, so two, shoe, seven, heaven, etc. Now, the way a peg word mnemonic works is that if you want to try to remember let's say a shopping list like this, or just an unrelated list of words like this, what you do, is, and you want to remember them in the order that you've been shown them, you associate each word with its corresponding one in the peg word mnemonic. So the first word, eggs, you associate with the bun. And what is suggested with this technique is that you create a mental image that looks quite distinctive to you. So you might think of it, some eggs in a bun. Then the next one is bread and shoes. And while I was putting this talk together, I thought, how can I do that? So I Googled bread and shoe and I got this. So these days you can get anything. So these, <laughs> these are two loaves of bread turned into what look like carpet slippers. Now, um, the idea is that you keep going. So the biscuits, you'd somehow create a, an image of a tree with your favorite biscuits hanging off them. And importantly, the more bizarre the uh, image that you create, the better. Because then afterwards, you can close your eyes and you think, one a bun, bun, what did I, oh, those, those eggs in the bun. And then two, shoo, 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 shoo. Oh, those funny slippers made out of uh, uh, bread. And so by creating these mental images that are quite vivid and sometimes bizarre, you're linking them with information that you've already got stored in your brain, which is the one a bun, two, a shoe, three, a tree, etc. So that when you're trying to recall them later on, you've got your important cue, one is a bun, and then you think of what was it that I recently thought of that went with the bun. And so these pegword mnemonics are really, really useful if, you, if people are trying to learn things in order. Um, and they're used quite a lot. Another one which <coughs> takes us back to uh, ancient Greece. So hello to my Greek friends. And this is known as the method of loci or the memory palace. And this is how the Greek famous orators who gave these huge speeches um, remembered what they wanted to say. What they were doing was to imagine a fancy palace that they knew. And they walked through the palace, leaving bits of what they wanted to say in different rooms in their imagination. And here, what we've got is kind of like an adult version of the peg word mnemonics, where you know, you've got those nursery rhymes, but now you've got the adult in their palace or whatever, and they're walking around in an order around their palace, leaving information in each one. So if you just have a house rather than the palace, what you would do is, and if this was your house, which is quite palatial in fact, uh, you, would, you would think of yourself walking through your house or room in a particular order. And what you would do is you would leave things in each of those different places. And you would try to create these, these images 
that would um, help you remember things better. Um, so the one a bun, two a shoe, etc. You could think of the chair and uh, um, uh, the what was it first eggs. So the chair full of eggs. The two a shoe. The second thing on my list was uh, the bread. So you could have the the desk overflowing with bread, etc. And so you would create these mental images, these visual images, so that later on, when you wanted to walk through, you could pick up those things from each of those locations. So these uh, techniques are useful. And here's a demonstration, because this is a man who used to be the world memory champion. And in this video, he tells you how he did it. The, the video is about uh, just over a minute long. And I've got to warn you that I think sometimes the sound is quite loud. So just to, you might just need to reduce your sound for a moment. So what's his secret? Before he even sits down with a deck of cards, Andy uses his memory technique. He takes a walk around London, visiting a series of landmarks in a particular order. Number one might be the Houses of Parliament. And number two, Westminster Bridge. He walks the route several times to establish it in his mind. But that's just the first stage. The second is putting his imagination to work. When I memorize a deck of cards, I turn each card into a picture. And this is a colorful animal or object that I've learned to associate with that particular card. The jack of clubs becomes a little bear. The nine of diamonds, a saw. And the two of spades, a pineapple. Then Andy puts the two stages together. In his mind, he imagines walking around London on his route. And when he passes the Houses of Parliament, he imagines a little bear with the saw and pineapple. Andy creates a journey in his mind with this cast of characters. As a child, I had conventionally good memory. But once you learn a technique, like the location method I use, it takes everything beyond what you could possibly do naturally. Scientists have discovered our mind is better at remembering the route between locations than it is at remembering unconnected facts and figures. I think I have the same mental equipment as everybody else. So it's something anybody can do. Okay, so um, earlier in that same documentary, the, this guy had been given, uh, Andy Bell, I think his name is, had been given uh, 10, stacks of, 10 st um, stacks of cards, each with the full 52 um, cards in it. And he had 20 minutes to remember all 520 cards in order. And he was able to do that in 20 minutes. But what you see is that he said there that he, when he was younger, he had an okay memory. He didn't, he wasn't born with this amazing ability. It was something that he developed by practicing this particular technique. Interestingly, I think it says uh, uh, at the end of the documentary, and I couldn't actually hear it because of the way that this is set up. I can't hear what you're hearing that um, part of this is that our memories for um, uh, our movement, etc., are better than just verbal memory. Now, that's rather interesting because the area that is really important for our memory is known as the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is this horseshoe shaped structure that's about an inch or so in from um, your temples. And that area as some of you will have seen from my lecture on memory and amnesia, is the area that if it's damaged um, through um, surgery or viral infections, etc., results in major amnesia. Interestingly, um, it's been found that that area is extremely big in London taxi drivers. Now, this is a kind of accidental finding which turned into a huge thing. 
because Eleanor Maguire, who's a researcher uh, at uh, UCL in London, she was doing a study on amnesia and she noticed that some people who were in her, what we call the control group, so people not with amnesia, so we compared the people with the condition, such as amnesia, with our people who don't have the condition. And um, in her control group, one of the people was exceptional at something. And she noticed that when they were doing brain scans, because it was a brain scanning study, this person had a humongously big uh, hippocampus. And um, she thought, what's going on here? When she found out that he was a taxi driver, she got interested. She then went and found other taxi drivers and she found that all of them had a bigger hippocampus. And this is rather amazing because um, the hippocampus, as well as, as being this memory thing, is also really important for our spatial navigation. So it's really important for us working out where we are moving forward, creating a, a map of where we are in the current world, which if you go back to the African savannah and Eve, when, he, when she took her, those first footsteps, it was really important where you were relative to the sun, those uh, hills, those bushes, etc. So you needed some way to register that information so that you could find those places again another day. And so the hippocampus has been linked to memory, but also spatial navigation. And what Eleanor McGuire found was that these London taxi drivers have got to learn this extremely difficult, uh, they've got to do this test called the knowledge, which takes them two years to learn, which is the street names of London streets, certain routes, et cetera, et cetera. She found that their hippocampus was bigger than non-cab drivers. And what she also found was that they weren't born with it, when she tracked people who were learning the knowledge, so training to be cab drivers, their hippocampus actually grew over the space of time. And in fact, um, Eleanor won what's known as the Ig Nobel Prize, which is a science prize, which is, first of all, makes you laugh, the study makes you laugh, and then makes you think. And so her study about black, uh, black cab drivers, uh, black cabs because the, the, the taxis are black in London, um, her study about uh, cab drivers having bigger hippocampi, first of all, sounds a bit mad, but then we realize it's to do with a really important memory process. So importantly, with Andy Bell, what you see is that it's the hippocampus that's probably working in the method of loci, et cetera, that you're moving, you're visually moving. And because that part of the brain, the memory part is being activated and it's really useful, for, it's really important in our spatial sense, we're able to capitalize on that really well. The next thing is known as the testing effect. And this is about how you bring information back. So we've gone through encoding, so taking the information in, then storage, and now we're going to in, uh, bring it back, which is retrieval. And what's been found is that active learning is much better than passive learning. So similarly to the um, thing about rote learning, here active learning is, uh, is uh, a tiny bit more complex. And this is found in what's known as the testing or test enhanced, uh, test enhanced learning or retrieval practice effect. So it's got lots of names, but this is what it means. This is a study done by an uh, important figure in the, research, in the area called uh, um, Rodiger. And what they did in this study was that they had one group of students who studied a piece of information and um, then they studied it again. So those are the ones in the black bars there. Another group, they studied the piece of information and then they were tested on it straight away. Um, and then tested again and again. Now, what they found is that the group that um, just studied each time but didn't get tested, after five minutes, they did quite well, but they uh, a bit better than the group that studied it and did a test straight away. But two days later, what they found is that the group that had had the initial test straight after learning 
they were actually doing better. So you see the two day graph. Now the people who did the study, study again, and then tested at five minutes, they've actually gone down. Whereas the ones who did the study and tested straight away, straight off the study, they're actually maintaining the information. And then a week later, what you find is that the people who studied and studied straight away, but didn't get tested until five minutes later, their information is getting really poor. Whereas the ones who were tested straight after the initial study, they're actually doing quite well. And um, it's difficult to explain now what this is about, but what that shows is that using information in an active way, which is testing straight off you've learned it, is really useful for what we call consolidating, which is strengthening the information trace. And what they've done here is capitalized on that. Whereas studying something and then just repeating it, which is kind of like the rote learning. So that's the black bars, the study, study people. That helps you if you want to remember something straight away. But in the long run, it's not actually helping you. So again, this is a different way of seeing that what you do with information is really important. If you test yourself on something straight away, you are actually helping yourself in the long run. Another issue is how you do your learning. Now, you can either have what's known as masked uh, practice. So you've got a test on the 22nd of a month and you could do four hours of, of studying the night before. Or you could do spaced practice where you do uh, 30 minutes on uh, various different days and they, they're not even uh, uh, consecutive days but you're doing 30 minutes on each of uh, the number of days and in total you get three and a half hours so you've got three and a half hours of testing uh, sorry uh, practice and uh, um, learning spread across uh, 12 days or so before the test on the 22nd so that's the the blue stuff or you have one big uh, massed practice and learning the day before. What happens? Well, in fact, at the test, the people who do the massed practice, they do really badly. The people who do the interleaved, where they do a bit of learning, then go away and do something else, and then come back the next day and do a bit more learning, then go away and do something else, then come back and do a bit more learning, and that's the interleaved or the spaced practice, they do much better in the end. And the spacing effect, w w the reason it's working is that in the mass learning, you end up with what's called habituation. Um, and habituation is basically getting used to something and getting bored. What happened is that you're seeing the same thing over and over again in your four hours of testing and you think I'm bored, seen that already, or your brain is, already, is thinking that at least at some level. And as a res result of that, your attentional system kind of just kind of gets a bit bored and it's not taking information in that well. So that encoding that I talked about right at the beginning, that's going to get worse and worse over time because you're just not paying attention. Whereas with the spaced learning, your attention is increased because it feels fresh every time. And the context might change as well because you might go and do something in a different room. It might be in the library, et cetera, et cetera. And the result of that is that, as I said earlier, with let's say the divers, et cetera, you've got lots of these different cues and those are going to help you as well. And those retrieval cues and the fact that you've got more attention each time rather than your attention going down like this means that you're taking in information better. And so each time, even though you're only studying for a shorter amount of time, you're using it much more efficiently. So basically, cues is the important thing. Now, um, here, um, this is a, good, uh, a, a, di uh, a suggested idea of how we store information. And um, memory is supposed to be set up as a network of associated ideas, concepts, and information. So if you're thinking of a fire engine, a fire engine is connected to 
things like being red, uh, to do with fire, to do with trucks, uh, to, uh, possibly to do with the ambulance service. But the word um, fire, uh, sorry, the word um, truck is linked to, it looks like a bus as well, it's a vehicle, it could be linked to a car, it could be linked to an ambulance as well. The word red is linked to all sorts of different colors. And so the idea is that each of each word that you know or concept is linked to other things. Now, when people think about or try to remember one piece of information, there's what's known as spreading activation that goes from the central thing that you're trying to remember, the fire engine, and you link it to the other things that you remember or that it's linked to in your brain. And each concept activates more information now, if, if those things that the fire engine that you're trying to think of is linked to, to these cues that you might remember, then the chances of re remembering it is increased. So to give you the example of, um, now, if I was to say to you, um, what was the first word in my shopping list? And you remembered the word uh, bun, what comes to mind? I'm sure I heard someone say eggs um, because what happened was that you got your, your first word bun, you had the visual image that's still there of the eggs in the bun and you know that the first word was uh, eggs. So that's what's happened there, that you're using these concepts and you're linking them to what's already in your mind. In the case of the peg word mnemonics or the method of loci, you're creating new connections this fire engine, etc., that's already there. So all the time, what you're doing is you're creating connections. Sometimes you're creating ones, sorry, sometimes you're using ones that are already there, like this, the concepts that you already know, but with the method of mnemonics or method of loci, etc., you're just using that, but creating new ones for yourself. The final thing I want to talk about, and I was going to do a whole thing on this, was about supplements. And then I realized I didn't need to. Um, so this is from Columbia University uh, in New York, and um, it's a page I found, or uh, uh, Claudia found, about memory boosters. And I'm just going to read. Um, uh, 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 Wouldn't it be possible to be able to remember names, appointments, and where you left your keys just by taking an uh, over-the-counter memory pill? Now, some natural supplements are supposed to improve memory and concentration. They're staying sharp as single as taking a supplement. Because each time someone asks me about improving their memory, they're effectively saying, give me a pill. And I say, there isn't one. Because here we go in the second paragraph, uh, Columbia University says, most experts agree that there's no solid proof that memory enhancing supplements work. These products may, contain, uh, may not even contain much of their active herbal ingredients, et cetera, et cetera. So the important point here is that whilst I was going to go through the ginkgo biloba and all the other things that have been associated with memory, I would say um, you've got to be very careful. There's lots of wordage out there suggesting that certain things improve your memory but we don't actually know that. There aren't enough good research studies that show this. So yes, maybe use those to supplement a good diet, but certainly don't do them instead of actually using your memory efficiently, which is what the cognitive um, research shows us. If any of these products was actually the memory booster, we'd know about it by now. Because trust me, those people have been doing research on these things. And if they had good research that showed that ginkgo biloba or whatever it is, um, improved your memory significantly, then they would be shouting from the rooftops about it. Um, so it's just a word of caution. I'm not saying don't take them, but I'm saying don't use them assuming that there's, they're going to put everything right. So in summary, memory is, a is very complex and involves a number of elements and a number of different processes. And we're all born with diff differences between us. And so some people always be naturally better than others. It is possible to improve at each of those three main levels of 
encoding, storage, and retrieval, as I um, outlined in the middle of the talk. But the differences aren't immediate. So this isn't something about learning the method of low and suddenly being fine with it. Lots and lots and lots of practice is needed. So Andy Bell, the guy in the video, said that, that it took him a long time to learn this and it needs to be constantly practiced um, because he can't keep going around the same house uh, in his head because it'll get cluttered. So he needs to keep using different places, learning different places, etc., for using this technique. An important other thing is that is an issue of what we call generalization. Getting good at using the method of loci for learning uh, lists of words isn't going to get you better at remembering a new language. It's, it's going to get you really good at learning lists of words or decks of cards and which card goes after which other card. But it's not going to get you better at remembering things that aren't related to that one thing. So that technique, whilst it's good, it only gets you really good at what that technique is good for. It doesn't result in a wholesale improvement on memory. So I think it's really important that people bear in mind this rather than assuming that you learn that technique and then suddenly all of your memory is fine. It's a horses for courses thing that you learn those techniques and you apply them appropriately in different circumstances. Um, so there is no cheat way to get good at this. There's no pill uh, um, and there's no one method that's going to get you better. Whereas using the, the information that I've, I've given during the talk, which is about the fact that um, we have to encode information and take it to, taking it to a deeper level, which is then coded the level of processing theory, and then storing it and organizing it well, unlike my under, uh, under the sink cupboard, storing it well in an organized fashion is helpful. And then the way that we try to remember it and retrieve it um, in that uh, way of the active retrieval, et cetera, all of that increases the chances. And memory is a muscle. So when you learn these techniques, you can use them in different ways. So my memory is a bit elephantine. So when I learn new things, I learn new things very well. But it's not because I was just born like that. It's because I've learned how to use those skills better. So the idea would be learn the different skills and apply them and apply them again and again until just like all skills we learn, it becomes just a habitual thing that you can do. Okay, um, finally, I just want to tell you about uh, my research team's uh, participant database. And this is a database that we're putting together to allow people to contribute, to, to take part in our research, because some of our research is online and we can send, send you a link and you can do the research the data, your personal information is always anonymized, so you wouldn't be identifiable, and I'd be the only person who'd have access to that database. And what we'd like uh, to do is to create a large database of people of, of different ages, different genders, um, different nationalities, etc. because sometimes we want to look at the effects of these different demographic variables on our research. So the biggest study we're doing at the moment is a study looking at um, dementia or trying to develop a test of dementia that can catch it much earlier than current tests of dementia are able to do. And if we can, if we can diagnose dementia earlier, we can preserve more of the individual before the nasty later stages of dementia have set in. And this has turned into an international project, translating it into a number of different languages. So um, if, um, uh, if anyone is interested in either being a participant, so anyone can do these studies as a participant, or if you're a researcher who's interested in this research, do get in touch. Um, we've got a lot of research on face recognition, on this condition called prosopagnosia or difficulty in recognizing faces. And then um, research on a task that I've developed called Jeff, uh, the Jansari Assessment of Executive Functions, and this is how the front of the brain manages behavior across a number of different conditions. And then finally, stroke rehabilitation. This is Pedro's PhD, 
where he's using music to try to improve uh, movement rehabilitation after stroke because it's found that music can be a really good key into a window in to unlock certain movements and to improve the chances of rehabilitation um, working. So um, if uh, one of my team hasn't already put the link for the database um, on there, I hope one of them will do so now. Um, and um, if you want to get in touch with us, you can email me or you can email Claudia, my PhD student at c.pulcinia.gold.ac.uk. So finally, it just leaves me to thank you. I know some of you have been very loyal and, and been to all 10 of my talks. So thank you for persevering with me and giving up your afternoons or evenings for this. So the first question is from Paul Jenkins, who's tuning in from the Prosopagnosia Facebook group. I know. So Paul's question is, does context, recall, uh, does context recall explain why when you go to do something in another room and when you get there, you forget the task until you return to the place where you had the original thought? Yes, Paul. Um, now, that doesn't mean that that's always how it happens, but what you've pointed out is exactly an important thing there. And this is why if you've forgotten something, Sometimes trying to recreate the context that you were in when you last remembered it is going to help you bring it back. Um, and forgetting is a very complicated uh, issue. So trying to explain it completely is not easy. But when we think about, for example, um, the tip, what's known as the tip of the tongue phenomenon, where you think, I know it, I know it, it's, it's just there. Sometimes what people do is that they keep trying harder and harder and harder to find that piece of information. But in fact, that doesn't help. Sometimes the best thing to do is to let go because by trying harder and harder, so in the equivalent of you being in a different room and having forgotten it, if you try really hard in that room, you're actually just making things worse. The best thing to do is either let go completely or go back to where you were and that might give you the cues that you need to recall something so um the retrieval cues are very complex as as you've seen from the talk but one of them might be that you've been distracted from what you were thinking about and going back into the previous room provides just the right cue that you need for, oh, I was looking at the curtains, the curtains made me think of that holiday, I was, I was on the holiday made me remember that I've got to renew my passport. So sometimes it's, it's that kind of incidental thing that results in those um, cues happening. And like that spreading activation thing that I showed towards the end sometimes it's that completely innocuous thing that helps you remember the information that you were trying to remember okay and the next question is from um, Lola Chabat and uh, the question is how come if we memorize something at night and sleep before really assimilating it when we wake up in the morning it is perfectly assimilated and memorized that's a beautiful question <laughs> Thank you so much for asking that, because that is actually one of the things that I wanted to talk about in this um, talk. But I realized it was going to get too complicated. And if I went down there, given that I'm a bit of a mad professor, I'm not a professor yet, but given that I can behave like one, I get too excited and then I can't stop. Basically, um, we're learning more and more that sleep is not to do with physical rest. Physical rest is useful, but that's not the main function of sleep. It seems that, that um, uh, and this is the bit that I don't know anything about, but sleep is very complicated and sleep has this particular what's called architecture. And there's different uh, waveforms within sleep and there's different uh, time points in sleep and different phases, etc. And there are certain sections during sleep where it seems that that hippocampus guy, the taxi driver guy again, is really, 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 really active. And what's probably happening there is a kind of general housekeeping. 
So it's almost like the difference between my uh, very uh, untidy below the sink cupboard and the tidied up version. And sleep seems to be doing that tidying up. So research has shown that um, it's not the difference in time between learning something and testing again that can be important. It's the amount whether you've had sleep in that gap or not. So um, in a study that was conducted as a really important study, they taught people uh, a bunch of information at nine o'clock in the morning. And then they tested them at nine o'clock in the evening. But importantly, before they tested them at nine o'clock in the evening, they taught them a bunch of new information, let's say at 8.30 in the evening. So what we've got is in the morning, teach something at 9.30, sorry, nine o'clock. 11 and a half hours later at 8.30, teach them something else and then test them on the stuff that they learned in the morning at nine o'clock. Do the same experiment, but teach people at nine o'clock in the evening, and then 11 and a half hours later, at 8.30 in the morning, teach them something else, and then test them on the stuff that they learned the previous evening. So exactly the same timings, et cetera, et cetera. The only difference is that with the second group, they slept in between. And what was found is that the people who learned, uh, who had to sleep, performed much, much better in remembering the information. Now, the reason for this is actually to do with the stuff that happened half an hour before the test. Because what they found is this thing called interference. And interference is basically that messed up stuff that comes in that gets in the way, so it's, it's there in front of you. And it seems that what um, sleep does is it protects the information from the interference. So if you don't have this messy stuff that happens because you're sleeping and your hippocampus is managing to do its housekeeping and tidy things up and put them in the right places, etc., when you when you learn that new information, by that time the th stuff is nicely tidied away already. Whereas if you learn in the morning and you haven't slept, the hippocampus is still doing its stuff, but maybe it's, it's not working a lot because it's really busy doing the other stuff that you need while you're waking. Because it's doing that, when you learn something just before your test, it hasn't fully organized your information. And so you get that interference and therefore poorer learning. So we're learning that sleep is really important for our cognitive processes. It's not just um, for physical rest. It's for a lot more than physical rest. So your question is really nice because it, it, it brings up that important issue. And uh, when I go to bed, I, I will often, like for the last couple of nights, as I'm going to sleep, I will think of, I've been thinking about this talk. And I've been thinking, okay, so I read this. And I think about the concept and um, the story that I want to tell you and think about how I'm going to link them all up. And I don't write it down. I just think about it because thinking about it is placing those things, you know, around the head somewhere. And I'm going to let the hippocampus guy do his, his or her work um, while I'm sleeping. And the next day, uh, even if I don't remember it straight away, while I'm doing the talk or preparing it, some of that stuff comes back. So sleep is really important for that. So thank you for your question. Uh, next question is from Nayan, uh, Nayanika Sengupta uh, um, from India, who's asked that she's seen a few of her classmates perform quite well by just studying a whole bunch of topics the previous night of an exam, which is quite similar to mass learning. Is it because they use memory aids like mnemonics and others, or is it that they innately have better memories than the average? And interestingly, in Anika, if your question, in your question, you said the night before, um, it may be simply because of the sleep, not because they did it just the night, not because of the mass learning. Now, please note that all of the concepts that I've talked to you about are not binary. So it's not that mass learning is bad and space retrieval is better. It's just that, generally speaking, 
it is better to space out your learning than to have one big solid go. One big solid go is not going to be, is in itself is not bad. We just know that generally speaking on average for most of us, doing a little bit every day, et cetera, is better. Um, it may be that maybe they're just innately better and they've, they've always known that they're, they're good at being able to cram it at the end. But one thing could be that they, they might not retain that information. Um, so, so if we go back to um, the retrieval practice effect, they might be like that group that just study something and then does the test and then it's all forgotten. Whereas, the, whereas people like yourself and other classmates, you might be learning during your, your term or semester and slowly improving your understanding. And you might end up with the same grades as those people who, who did the mm -hmm. studying just before the test. You might end up with the same grades, but they'll have forgotten it all within a couple of days and you might hold on to it better. So in a way, what this shows us is that sometimes it's about what you're trying to do with that information. If you just need to learn it for that test, then maybe it's okay. But, but as a general rule of life, I wouldn't recommend it. Okay, the next question is from uh, Tony Chabat. I hope I'm saying your name correctly, Tony. Um, do tell me off if I'm not. Um, so Tony has asked, has it been proven that regular use of card games, Sudoku, etc., helps maintain healthy brain behavior at older age? That's a, another lovely question. And um, in a way, um, it hasn't been proven that these things help, but we do know that effectively regular use of any skill keeps it up. So there is, uh, I think it was in Toronto, a hundred, hundred year old man, a Sikh man, who's done a marathon and he's done quite a few marathons. Now he probably didn't start when he was 99 years old to run. He's probably been doing it for a while. And so that thing of keeping up a skill is really important. And in cognitive psychology, and especially in aging, there's this concept which is use it or lose it. So if you keep using it, then it stays as a skill. If you don't use it, you lose it. Now, an example from my own experiences is, is that um, I've been uh, going to Italy for the last 30 years or so, and uh, I eventually learned Italian um, by going to evening classes uh, here in Brighton, in fact, about 25 years ago. And so I speak Italian now. Uh, it's not 100% fluent, but I speak Italian. However, uh, I go maybe three times a year or so to visit my wonderful family in Venice. And what tends to happen is that the first day or so, I, I sound like an idiot or a child because I'm, I'm getting words wrong or I'm forgetting the, forgetting the words I want to say or, or I'm forgetting the verbs, etc. But then after a day or two, it comes back. Now, if I was staying in Italy, then I wouldn't get to that point where I sound like a child. So because I'm not using it, it's not, I'm not losing it but it's, it's uh, becoming weaker. So like someone who uh, learned a, a musical instrument as a child, mm -hmm. but didn't use it as, at all afterwards, they might lose it completely. So these things like card games, Sudoku, etc., what they're doing is that they're keeping some of those skills alive. Now, an important thing um, that I, I, I there isn't any proof of it, but an important thing that one could say from any form of cognitive psychology is to have a variety of things. So just doing one thing is not going to be good enough. So this is why having a variety of things is useful. So reading uh, literature or newspapers, doing crosswords, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that classic thing of variety is the spice of life. Um, just as in life, I mean, if you talk to lots of people of different ages and different backgrounds, you end up uh, kind of 
uh, exercising that muscle of being able to understand differences between people easily. But if you have a narrow group of friends who all have the same interests and attitudes to life as you, that doesn't get practice. So you, you find other people's views really weird. So it's a similar kind of concept that variety and, and um, uh, uh, keeping on going is really important. And um, there's an English saying, which is, um, I think you can't teach an old dog new tricks, but you can. Um, I've got uh, my friend Jilly, who's uh, uh, going to be 80 in a couple of years' time, and she keeps learning new things, uh, how to use WhatsApp, uh, how to, uh, to, to use the internet, etc. So part of it is just an attitude. So I think that it is possible. It'll, if you keep uh, using these different cognitive skills, doing the Sudoku, reading, etc., then that keeps all those primary skills active and that will mean that in terms of aging cognitively you will age less okay uh, the next question is from Teresa mullins who's i think a radiographer um uh, Teresa asked um further to the sleep memory link do you think a chronic insomnia could suffer hippocampal atrophy as a result of chronic sleep deprivation at all so um uh, by hippocampal atrophy, what um, Theresa means is that a, sh a shrinkage. Um, I think it's difficult to answer that question. Uh, so what Theresa is saying that given that, that I said that the hippocampus is useful um, or becomes very active during sleep um, to do all this work, is it the case that it is, um, if you don't use it, then it's going to shrink? So almost the reverse of our taxi drivers who are learning new routes all the time and their hippocampus increases. I would say that, that it's unlikely that it would atrophy because the hippocampus is doing a lot more than just doing that housekeeping. Um, and so it may be that the hippocampus is affected a bit. And in fact, that could be a research project that you could do with me if you wanted. So we could look into that, <laughs> if we could find a way to look at it. But um, I certainly think it's an interesting question, but what are the hippocampi of uh, chronic insomniacs like? So maybe that'll be another talk, but it's not gonna be next week. <laughs> Next question is from Avril in Dublin, and Avril asks, similar to the que above question, is napping enough for the hippocampus or is a full seven hours required? Haven't got a clue. Not a clue. <laughs> um, I think that there are in enough individual differences that for some people a nap will suffice. Um, but I think that what I've heard is that sleep comes in um, these packets that are known as quanta and a packet of sleep is about two and a half hours so i think that um, you go in and out of these different stages but each packet is about two and a half hours which is why i think that um, a bit of extra sleep actually makes you feel a bit rubbish because if, if you start a new packet, let's say you woke up at seven o'clock and you thought, uh, I'll just sleep for a bit longer and you fall into deep sleep and then your alarm goes at eight o'clock because you're still halfway through one of your two and a half hour quant uh, packets, um, you aren't refreshed properly. And that is what I've heard that if they wake people up at particular points in sleep studies, when they know that they've they've come out of one of the packets, then they're actually better. Um, so I think the sleep question is a really complex one and it's an interesting one. And as I said, the understanding of the importance of sleep is a relatively newish one. Um, so uh, there's going to be a lot more work on that. And we know, for example, that uh, people with certain types of temporal lobe epilepsy, 
they also have sleep disturbances and those sleep disturbances may be related to some of the memory problems that they've got. And unfortunately, we don't yet have the tools to know which is the chicken and which is the egg. Is it the epilepsy that's causing the sleep problems, which is causing the memory problems or, or are the memory problems there anyway? And the epilepsy is just an outward manifestation of it. So, um, we know that these things are linked, that good sleep um, involving good, um, what's called REM sleep, which is a particular type of uh, deep sleep, is uh, that goes with good memory. But we don't know the causal issues that are there. So it's, I think it's going to be a really interesting new frontier. Uh, and when that is done, whoever can find a good way to get people to good, get to good sleep is going to make a lot of money. Okay. Um, I, I'm waiting to see if there are any more questions. At the moment there aren't, which will mean that uh, I can go out and enjoy the Prosecco that I've bought and which is nicely chilling in the fridge uh, to celebrate the end of my series of 10 talks uh, and have the lamb masaka that is currently being heated up. So um, I'm going to wait another minute or so while I sip this to see if there are any questions. Um, I'm going to assume that my lovely team did put the link to our survey database um, on Facebook. And um, there are no more questions. So I'm going to love you and leave you. Thank you very much uh, for tuning in. Thank you for your patience. I hope you've enjoyed the talks and uh, please do feel free to get in touch. Uh, I, I'm open to offers of coming and giving talks to different organizations or schools, etc. But I'm also open to research studies with um, researchers mm -hmm. abroad. So um, do feel free to get in touch and um, we will be in touch maybe about research studies or also about um, uh, future talks. So thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>